past 10 years, ancient DNA and the science around it has revolutionized our understanding of different aspects of the past throughout the world. And lying at the very westernmost point of Europe, Ireland has and is yielding many fascinating insights about the movement of humans and, and animals. And at the very forefront of this research have been Dan Bradley and Lara Cassidy, both from the Smurfit Institute of Genetics in Trinity College, Dublin. And I would like to now welcome Dan and Lara to the stage for their lecture entitled Tales from a Small Ireland, Ancient Genomics on the Ancient Edge. Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, that is a hard act to follow. This is a difficult slot between the performance and the drink, but uh, I'll try and keep your attention anyway. So, um, uh, first of all, thank you, Eileen and the organizers. It's a real honor to be asked to, to to co give this lecture and uh and it's fantastic to be here it's um genetics and archaeology are such different disciplines and it's difficult to get the interplay between the two so it's it's great to be here and get the chance to to listen over the week to so much archaeology so um uh what we're going to talk about are in in the in the spirit of weaving an art of our three tales um, this, this comes from work that we've done in the Department of Genetics in Trinity College over the last decade or, or a little bit more uh, in, in a lab that's co-led by myself and Lara. And uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell you something of an introduction and something about migration. And Lara will then move into uh, the cousin's tale, which is about kinship, biological kinship, and the survivor's tale, because genetics, of course, is, is very important for health and um, has a, uh, is central to evolution. And uh, so, so the first thing is to say, whenever we talk about migration, uh, migration, it really was a culture shock for me um, some 10 years ago to find that migration was actually quite a value-laden term um, in, in some parts of archaeology. It's not genetics. It's just something you measure. Um, but anyway, how do we detect it? How do we measure it? And what is it about the genetics of ancient Europeans and what methods do we use that allow us to do that? So there are three aspects really that give us the power with ancient DNA um, to, to measure an unfair migration. And the first is the scaling up of data acquisition, which is something that, that has happened uh, in recent years. It took the first human genome uh, something like $300 million in a decade to be sequenced now your human genome because of medical technology can be sequenced in an afternoon and costs less than a thousand dollars. I'm not even sure how much it costs now because the costs keep on decreasing all the time. Um, that's a modern human genome. It costs more to sequence ancient human genomes. Uh, secondly, new haplotype methods. That's um, uh, ways of comp computing and uh, inferring um, relationships from ancient data and modern data. And thirdly, the the material we're working with, the, the divergence that, that is there in prehistoric populations. So, well, what is genetic data? And it has it has quite quite a pedigree, quite a, an ancient pedigree in in terms of academia. The, the, on the on the left here is a slide from one of my predecessors in the Department of Genetics in Trinity, and uh, it's a a slide of rhesus negative frequency. That's one genetic locus. And as you can see, uh, there's a, a gradient in, measured in 1958 and drawn on this old glass slide um, across Ireland. And that's because of history. You know, genes have a past and the patterns we see today are because of that past. Um, on the right is uh, the gradient of another gene, the O blood group. Um, uh, you know, a single segregating variant, and it has a geography across uh, these two islands. Um, and it's a recent geography because I've just put in a circle there, and that's uh, a sample that we sequenced some years back of individuals of Britons from York, um, from the Roman era. So it's, it's a geography, a genetic geography that's changed. And these are interesting. Uh, you know, they, they tell us something, but they're they're a bit limited in that they're based on one locus. And one locus is not a lot of data. So what do we work with now? Well, in ancient and modern genomes, we work with hundreds of thousands of genetic loci. So we have gone up a factor of 10 to the five in the sort of data we work with. 
So it's been a huge change. And what can you do with this sort of data? Well, um, what, what you can do is you can plot individuals in genetic space. So this is a map of European individuals all coded by the two-letter codes, ES for España, PT for Portugal. And as you can see, uh, people with Spanish and Portuguese ancestry clustered to, together down in here in this two-dimensional genetic space in a, in, in a sort of genetic Iberia. Um, in a peninsula, uh, you can see another peninsula here. Um, oops. This is IT Italians. And here are some unusual Italians. Turns out they're island Italians, they're Sardinians. Up here at the top, we've got GB, uh, breaking away from Europe, as you can see, not quite managing it. Uh, uh, and, and IE, not quite breaking away from Britain either, as you can see. <laughs> and, and why would it? Um, but as you can see, there's an east, west, north, south, Genetic geography, uh, which which we can we can we can uh, we can plot and infer, and um, it has implications for uh, for different things, including um, forensics. But uh, the second thing I was going to mention is haplotype matching. So what this is, this is a uh, for illustration, it's a it's a, a detection of plagiarism uh, from a student. And how do you detect plagiarism? You don't do it by single words. You do it by strings of words in sentences. And um, sentences have genealogies. And if you submit a paper and the genealogy of your sentence is from somewhere else, it's detectable because you can detect in strings. And genes are the same. They occur in chromosomes. And you can infer genealogical relationships very securely using this method, which is identity by descent, um, uh, based on strings of matches. So genealogical relationships, strings of variants in DNA is a very secure way of, of, of detecting relationship. And then thirdly, uh, whenever we now know from ancient uh, DNA, and some of this is done by us, but of course much done by other excellent research groups in the field, whenever humans emerge from the ice in, in Europe, they emerge in very divergent populations. And why is that? It's because these populations overwintered in different places. They followed different trajectories through time. They were separated and they're different. And uh, they, they, they mix together in modern Europeans. I've just, um, Emily Breslin, one of our group is giving a talk on, on some of the, our upper Paleolithic work uh, on Saturday. Um, this one's an interesting one. These are early European farmers. With the advent of the Neolithic, they spread through Europe. Um, and uh, have a profound effect on European populations. And later, these other two to the right, uh, they um, they mix in in the third millennium BC, um, again altering European genetics. So uh, the 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 question I'm going to ask and try and answer in my little bit of the talk is: If you, one looks at Ireland, we're just going to look at Ireland. Was the population of Ireland uh, was its history through time a smooth one or a rugged one? We had change. Everywhere has change. But were the changes gradual or, in a temporal sense, episodic? Were there cliff edges? That's the question. Were there cliff edges in the population history, population prehistory of the island of Ireland? So I'm going to use three samples for illustration. Um, the first is a Mesolithic genome sample. The, third, the second is from Balanahati, quite close to here, um, a Neolithic sample. And the third is from Rathlin Island, an early Bronze Age sample. And what we're going to do is plot them on our map of Europe. So where do the Mesolithic hunter-gatherer samples, not just the Irish sample, but Western hunter-gatherers, where do they fall? They fall above, they fall northwards in the plot of Europe, um, up here at the top, in a sort of genetic Valhalla. It's a it's a genetic place that doesn't exist anymore um, because the, the, their descendants do exist, but their descendants have don't exist uh, in the form they were. They've mixed through into the population uh, pool that is Europe today. Um, secondly, what happens? 
uh, whenever you look at a Neolithic sample. And uh, this is just to point out that uh, the first uh, genomes from the British Isles were sampled and uh, sequenced by ourselves in a collaboration, which was a Trinity uh, Queen's University Belfast collaboration. So we're very proud of that, actually. And what's the story they told? This is Valena Hattie. Um, as it sees from a Neolithic uh, tomb a few miles away from here, very few miles away. And she's famous. She had a facial reconstruction. And um, she falls down here, close to Sardinia. And in fact, this is typical of Neolithic samples from, from Western Europe. This is where they fall. And this distance between the earlier Mesolithic genome and the later uh, genome, it's, it's too far for this to have been just from indigenous drift. This indicates a severe change in composition, which comes from migration. And was that migration, um, was, it, was that typical? That's only one genome. Well, in fact, whenever we look at a whole range of genomes, 42 Neolithic genomes from, um, from Ireland sampled from different tombs, you find that, yes, it is typical. Um, with one exception, or one one individual from um, uh, Carlton Jones's excavations in Park Nabinia in County Clare, and this is an interesting individual because uh, using the genealogical detection technique, the plagiarism detection technique, um, we were able to infer that one individual out of the forty-two had a Mesolithic great great grandparent, um, and that great Mesolithic great great grandparent was an Irish Mesolithic because it was more similar to the Irish sample than to other Mesolithic samples. Now, that's interesting because, first of all, it shows that there wasn't a full population replacement at the Neolithic. So there was some, some inheritance genetically came through from the Mesolithic. But the other side of it shows, it shows we have the power to detect great-great-grandparent um, ancestors, and only one out of 42 showed that. So therefore, there are 672 ancestral genomes that were surveyed, and only one of those well, it was an Irish Mesolithic. So it was a fairly overwhelming genetic process, um, this transition to farming. Secondly, um, now all our earliest genomes were from Northern Ireland. It's not because I'm from Northern Ireland, it's because we have this collaboration from Queen's. Um, but uh, the, we, we were fortunate enough to get uh, the chance to sample some early Bronze Age samples from Rathlin Island. Uh, this is a kiss burial they're from. and. Um, where do they fall? Well, this is an example. It falls up here, not so far, actually, from where uh, populations from the western parts of the British Isles falls today. Um, so, and again, this is a radical change. It's a radical change. Now, that's only one genome plotted here. Is that a radical change that occurred uh, instantaneously or sharply? Not instantaneously, but sharply. Or is it is it part of a continuum? You know, it's only one data point. So what we need are more data points from the Bronze Age and beyond to answer this question. Was the transition into metallurgy um, roughly 2400, 2500 BC on the island, was it one that was linked to genome change or not? Was there a cliff edge? So if you plot the percentage of Anatolian ancestry, roughly, for um, individuals through time. So this is just a plot of a, a percentage of the Anatolian ancestry through time, which starts out um, low, zero, because these are just two Mesolithic genomes. Then it rises sharply uh, just after 4000 BC. And then you have a plateau of Neolithic ancestry, early farmer ancestry, Anatolian ancestry, whereas the majority component. And then there is, yes, there is a cliff in ancestry which occurs around about 2500, 2400 BC. It's pretty sharp. Now, there is complexity because if you color those samples, um, these are colored according to age, apart from the ones from 2400 on, where some of these Burials are from reuse of megaliths in the Copper Age, Stroke Bronze Age, um, and then some are not. And you find there's a difference. There's less of a 
change in those from the, the megalithic context than there is in the others. Uh, so it is with complexity, but it's still profound, massive, and I would argue in, in archaeological time, pretty sharp as a cliff edge. Lastly, uh, just a, a shout out for Victoria, who's giving a talk again on Saturday, and she's looking at the same period with cattle. And cattle, cattle don't show a cliff edge. There's a spoiler, but there's more to our talk than that. So. <laughs> Hello. Okay. So I am going to be moving us on to the second of the three tales, and this is going to be the cousin's tale. And in this, um, I, I just want to consider a little about what ancient DNA can tell us about kinship. And obviously, there's a lot of things it cannot uh, tell us. But one thing DNA does provide is direct information on, on shared descent, uh, which Dan touched on earlier. It allows us to construct true genealogies and, and map genetic relatedness between members of a community. And those patterns, they are going to be inevitably shaped by the kinship systems and the marriage customs of those communities. And um, I want to say I am not saying here uh, that genetic relatedness alone determines kinship. Uh, it's, it's almost actually the reverse. We're more leveraging the fact that culture and a, and a kinship system can determine genetics in the archaeological record, and that's how we can learn um, about kinship. So how do we detect shared descent in the genetic record? Dan touched on this, but uh, people who share a recent ancestor are going to share long chunks of identical DNA sequence uh, inherited from that ancestor. So say we've got two cousins here. You can see they share this orange chunk inherited uh, from their shared grandparent. And just for example, some of you might have done a, a 23andMe test, and if you did, you might have gotten a result that looked something like this, telling you that they've discovered your second cousin, who are, you are now uh, morally obliged to invite to your wedding, because uh, that's how kinship works. And this is all down to you sharing these IBD segments that we can detect on the chromosomes. You can see them here. But what's really exciting is that we're getting to the stage in ancient genomics where we can actually match this level of resolution. If we generate good enough quality data, we can apply the exact same type of analyses uh, to ancients as we do with moderns. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, I've kind of cheated the result I'm showing you here. It's not from 23andMe, it's actually from our lab. And this is not two modern individuals. This is uh, a result for two adult males from Neolithic Ireland. And uh, we found that these men, they're approximately fifth degree relatives. So they too could be second cousins, but their median radiocarbon dates are about 200 years apart. So that's something 23andMe doesn't really have to worry about, at least yet. So we could be uh, sampling something closer here to a direct ancestor descendant relationship. But there's something actually quite unusual uh, about these two relatives, and that is that they weren't found um, in the same location, uh, not even close. They were actually interred over 100 kilometers apart uh, in two of the most spe uh, spectacular uh, monumental landscapes uh, in Ireland, uh, some would say in Europe. Uh, the first came from uh, the Mega Passage tomb at Newgrange, which I think some of you have already uh, visited today or yesterday. Um, the other site, um, some of you might not know as well, but I think deserves just as much love. This is Carrow Keel in County Sligo, and this is another really incredible passage complex uh, where the monuments are, are perched on top of various hilltops. So then our question here is how have two relatives come to their final resting places, uh, first in such auspicious locations, but also so far away from one another? And the most parsimonious explanation we have here is that we are sampling members of an elite. Uh, a long distance kinship network between monumental tombs is something we'd expect for quite a complex uh, society with elite mobility. And we have uh, two additional pieces of evidence for that elite. The first is that we found that other pairs of, of passage tomb samples uh, from other sites, they also show uh, some excesses uh, of genome sharing causing them to cluster genetically, which you can see in pink here. 
The second is that the individual from Newgrange, uh, he was not only exceptional in his sampling location, so his remains were uh, uh, sampled from the right-hand recess, uh, which is a focal point in Irish passage tombs, and then obviously Newgrange itself is a focal point within the wider ritual landscape of Bruna Boinia. But this uh, man's genome, it was also exceptional in that he was the son of first degree relatives, which is an incredibly rare observation uh, in both modern and ancient genomic data sets. And that makes sense because we know that the, the first degree incest taboo, uh, that's one of the few cultural universals, probably for underlying uh, uh, biological reasons. And we only have a handful of uh, confirmed uh, historical cases where this behavior was sanctioned by society. And all of those are sibling marriages uh, among uh, dynastic elites. Uh, we also see that the practice strongly associates with monumentality uh, and a degree of political deification. So this is interesting uh, that potentially observing such a rare marriage custom could tell us something about politics or even the religion. Uh, of a past society, if uh, uh, ethnographic analogy can be considered a useful tool in archaeology, which I think it can, and, and I actually think it's one of the most exciting things about genetic data at the moment, that it's opening up a, a whole new avenue for cross-cultural uh, comparisons, uh, for understanding how human societies vary through space and time, and, and even maybe why they vary. Okay. So we're now going to jump forward in time to the Bronze Age. And here I want to talk about a related application of IBD analysis. And this is the potential to produce detailed maps of connectivity between archaeological sites. So this isn't about the flow of trade necessarily. This is about substantial movement of people and marriage partners. So we're talking about people for once, not pots. <laughs> and we know that. This is uh, influenced primarily by geography, right? It's, it's way easier to marry somebody down the road from you. But culture is obviously going to play a very important role as well. Political boundaries, ethnic differences, uh, economy and technology can all uh, influence uh, and shape choice of marriage partner. And as an example of this, I, I want to look at the Bronze Age population from Rathlin Island that Dan mentioned earlier. Uh, since 2016, we sampled a lot more genomes from Bronze Age uh, Ireland, and other ancient DNA labs have been uh, very, uh, very productive as well. So we now have something like 132 genomes from across Britain and Ireland that are amenable uh, to IBD analysis. And now what we can do is put the Rathlin population into much better context. The question being which sites show the most shared ancestry uh, with the Rathlin population. And we can visualize this uh, with a nice uh, interpolated map here where more red is more IBD shared with the Rathlin population. And what we're seeing is that Rathlin's uh, IBD neighborhood, uh, it's quite a maritime one, right? Its top pits are uh, along the north coast of Ireland and also uh, the west coast of Scotland. So this is a really interesting pattern because it suggests that uh, these populations may have had a relatively strong seafaring culture. Uh, perhaps not unlike the one we see millennia later in the medieval period when we know that there were close political ties uh, between these two seaboards. So in some societies, depending on culture, depending on technology, the sea might not act as a barrier, uh, a geographic barrier to movement, but could even uh, potentially be a unifier in some cases. And just uh, to contrast, here is another Bronze Age population we sampled, this time from outside of Dublin. Uh, a keen oak. And here what you're seeing is that the highest hits are further south, actually in and around the modern day province of Leinster. Uh, while our Rathlin population, in contrast, is showing very little sharing with these sites on the eastern seaboard. So what we're basically catching here is different spheres of mobility and potentially even different spheres of influence. And uh, that resolution, that's only going to sharpen uh, the more we sample. And so this is one of the really, I think, exciting kind of horizons in ancient DNA. Right, so this is the third uh, and the final part of the cousin's tale. We like doing things in threes. And uh, this is going to bring us to the early medieval period. So moving forward in time. And what I want to do now is look at kinship within a single site. And this site, it's an enclosed rural settlement and a secular cemetery at Ranala 
uh, in County Roscommon. And this is part of a bigger multidisciplinary project uh, with, with TII and again with Queen's. And this type of site, this is a very common and a very well studied uh, site type in uh, early medieval Ireland. It's been argued that most probably represent familial burial grounds, although it's possible that some serve larger communities. And this is something that we can now uh, start directly testing uh, with ancient DNA. And Ranala is also uh, interesting in this regard because it grew into something of a regional uh, hub. Uh, through time, and that could have potentially changed how the cemetery was being used. So the first thing we can ask then is, okay, are we finding then a lot of genetic relatives at Ranala, and, and how does that relate to the different phases of the site's usage? So here you are seeing the number of relatives identified for each individual plotted against their median date. And what you see is that during the main phases of occupation here, uh, nearly everyone is related. You can see genealogical links as lines, and, and they connect nearly all individuals over the course of about uh, three centuries. So that's really nice. That's confirming what has long been hypothesized about these types of sites, and uh, suggesting that even in Ranala's heyday, it seems to be acting primarily uh, as the burial ground for one family. Another thing we also see is that a single Y chromosome lineage dominates at the site, which, which you can see in pink here. And that fits uh, very well with what we know from the historical record about Gaelic land ownership and how that was organized around patrilineal descent groups uh, called Dervinia. So uh, that's something we're actually quite lucky with in Ireland, that we have this very old and, and very rich vernacular history, um, including Gaelic inheritance laws. And we're going to be able to compare them to, to the genetic record going forward and, and see how they relate, but also see if they always agree with each other uh, and uh, differences between sites. And then finally, the last point I want to want to make here um, is that we do have also individuals with no relatives yet detected at the site. So you could ask the question then, if this is a familial cemetery, who are they? And importantly, uh, they still could be family members. They could be spouses who married in with no descendants. They could be fostered children. One thing we also really need to remember is that we have a limit of resolution here at about the degree of third cousins. So we're not gonna be able to detect, detect uh, individuals from, from more distant branches of a clan. So, yeah, what I'm saying, uh, again, is DNA can't alone give us uh, a full picture of kinship at any site. Um, and we're always going to have to consider other forms of data. And one of the most important is, of course, going to be the burial context. I'm just touching on this. But one example we could look at is, is spatial distribution. So here at Ranala, I've highlighted burials uh, in light blue who don't have any detectable genealogical ties to the main family. And you can see that they tend to fall at the edges of the main area of burial activity. This is the pattern so far. So that could imply a, a different status, either within the family, or maybe these are not family members. They could be dependents of the family. And kind of going maybe in that vein, we can then ask another question is, OK, well, are these individuals still then from the local area uh, around Ranala? Uh, and we can do that using isotopes or DNA, uh, or if, if you're very lucky, both, uh, both is usually best. And just one example at Ranala, we have actually found uh, two of these unrelated individuals are also outliers with respect to their geographic origins. So this is a, a woman and an infant uh, who were buried together, uh, but they are also not related to each other. And their genetic profiles you see here, they are not typical uh, for medieval populations from the west of Ireland, which you see down here. Uh, instead, we're seeing a substantial amount of uh, British-type ancestry. So I, I could go into a lot more detail here. I'm not going to. Uh, but if, if you do want to hear more about sort of these fine-scale approaches to identifying non-locals, uh, please do check out uh, um, one of our group's talk, Maeve, uh, on Saturday, where she looks into this more. Final, then, uh, of the three tales, uh, this is going to be the survivor's tale. So genomes, uh, our genomes, they don't just hold a record of our ancestry. They also tell stories of life and death. Uh, we know malnourishment, infectious disease, and, and high rates of, of child mortality were, were all the norm uh, for populations like uh, the one living at Ranala and many in the past. 
But every one of you here today uh, is the descendant of survivors, uh, people who lived long enough to have children of their own. And we would expect any traits that increased those odds of survival, uh, these would increase in frequency uh, over time in the population. That is natural selection. And it's an incredibly powerful evolutionary force. And I, I just want to touch on one of the most textbook classics, classic uh, examples of natural selection in humans, which is lactase persistence, this ability to drink milk into adulthood. And Ireland actually has uh, the highest frequency of this trait in the world. But we want to then ask the question, well, when did this trait actually undergo selection? When did it rise in frequency in the population? And this is actually a question we've only been able to definitively answer uh, relatively recently with ancient genomes. So we now know uh, that the associated mutation was uh, rare in the early Bronze Age, but it has risen rapidly and relatively steadily through time, uh, maybe plateauing a little in recent centuries. So that, uh, that's really nice. That answers the question of when, but uh, the more difficult and, and more interesting question is also uh, why. Why was milk such a matter of life and death in Ireland in the past? And um, I should mention recently, Nick Patterson and colleagues um, uh, looking at a similar data set in Britain, they suggested this might be to do with differences in dairy economies between the islands of Britain and Ireland and those on the continent during the Iron Age. And that, that could indeed be one factor. But for the pressure to remain constant for so many millennia in Ireland, that suggests some more fixed underlying environmental pressure. And like uh, so many issues in Ireland, uh, the problem could possibly be the weather. So other genes uh, we found with signatures of selection in Ireland, these paint a picture of, of a sun-starved population. And we need uh, UV light from the sun to synthesize vitamin D. And vitamin D is essential uh, for efficient calcium absorption, healthy bones, and a healthy immune system. And we saw this even during the COVID-19 pandemic, where vitamin D deficiency and calcium deficiency uh, were strongly correlated with the uh, disease severity and, and poor prognosis. And actually, the same is true for tuberculosis. So lactose uh, increases calcium absorption in the gut, uh, which could have given ancient immune systems uh, the boost they basically needed uh, when they were constantly being battered by infections. And it should also be noted that Ancient DNA allows us to actually study the evolution of those infectious agents themselves. And don't worry, I'm not going to talk about that. But if you are interested in that topic, do again, I'm going to do another plug. Check out um, uh, Esau Jackson's talk uh, on, on Saturday on, on dental uh, pathobionts and the oral microbiome. Okay, and then to finish, uh, I've been talking... Uh, a lot about how long-term hardships um, that were endured by our ancestors, that these can shape genomes uh, over many millennia. But ancient DNA uh, also provides snapshots of population and individual health um, at particular points in time. And there's an old uh, kind of cliche adage that uh, mended bones uh, are the earliest manifestations of, of human compassion in the archaeological record. But DNA also lets us move beyond uh, the bone and understand the experience of individuals with genetic uh, diseases and disorders that, that may be quite invisible in the archaeological record. And as an example of this, I'm just going to bring us full circle back to the Irish Neolithic, to Pulnebrone uh, portal tomb, uh, where we sequence the genome of a male infant with three copies of uh, chromosome 21, which results in Down syndrome. And we also found that this infant, uh, he had an isotopic signature consistent uh, with being breastfed. So that could suggest that this infant then uh, was cared for uh, in his short life. And his interment at Pulnebrone also suggests that his death was of some significance uh, to his community. So as you've seen uh, during this talk, uh, an ancient genome can tell stories that span centuries and, and, and millennia even, but at the most base level, um, a genome belonged to an individual, and it can also help humanize that person and tell us something of their own uh, life story. And uh, I'm going to leave you there. I just quickly like to acknowledge all the members of our research teams at Trinity, um, our amazing, wonderful collaborators, too many to mention, all 
uh, funders, uh, the organizers of EAA for giving us the honor to talk to you all today and uh, you all uh, for listening. Uh, I hope everyone has a, a fantastic EAA. Gurumila uh, Malgov. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Dan. And and um, it's like the Decameron of genomics with all those tales. And um, I'm pleased that Lara's connected it with with sessions over the next few days as well. So, but you, you know who they are, so you can you can go pester them over a pint of milk outside now. And um, but we're very fortunate to have the quality of academic excellence shown by Lara and Dan, and indeed by Eileen sitting next to them and others in this audience here in Ireland, um, you are changing the narrative we weave of Ireland's past in, 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 in such a transformative way. It, it, it's quite remarkable and it's very, very exciting. So thank you, Lara and Dan. We're almost before the milk at the end of the opening ceremony. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're in for a bit of a treat now. Um, we're going to be led out of the ceremony and into the reception by um, our archeological colleague and friend, James McKee, will be playing a fourth century, a replica, I have to say to museum colleagues, a replica of a fourth century um, horned instrument discovered at Loch Neshade in County Armagh. Um, James will then be accompanied by his fellow performers from the world-renowned Armagh Rhymers, who will keep that entertainment going um, in the reception area. The Rhymers wear masks. They're crafted from flax, willow, and straw. And their activities are based on the traditional practice of mumming. And this masked tradition of rhyming with its unique blend of music, drama, song and dance dates back over two and a half thousand years. And is a very important part of Irish folk traditions. And with that, it's a wrap. The narrative we have, I feel, chosen to weave this evening is, is one of partnership. It's one of friendship. It's one of solidarity. It's one of recognizing cultural diversity here in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. It's one of recognizing academic excellence, of recognizing the talent and, and hope of youth and, and of the hope and ambition of this place and indeed for archaeology. So put your hands together for this place, for Belfast, for Conference Centre for all the prize winners and all those involved this evening and all the organizers and the EAA, everybody too, far too few to mention, all those wonderful artists who've entertained us this evening. And thank you for attending. And on behalf of all involved, may you have a super, super time here in Belfast. Mm -hmm.